13th chapter. And this, of course, is our continuing remembrance of this 40 days in Lenten services and season. At that time, some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else, for Herod wants to kill you. Jesus replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who, sent, who sent, sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings? But you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here ends the lesson. Let us pray. Bless our time together, God, and ask you to inspire us by your word, God. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of all those present hearts be acceptable in your sight, the Lord our strength and redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today's lesson is really an intriguing story because it gives us an insight into something about Jesus that you probably didn't even recognize or probably have never seen anywhere else because it isn't in any other gospel except here in the Gospel of Luke. And you're wondering, what in the world am I talking about? The very first part is not a big surprise, and that is that Jesus was a threat to the Pharisees. For those at home, by the way, who do not have a handout, you're welcome to go to one of our Facebook pages. It is not online. The sermon handout is not yet online. But you're welcome to go to one of our Facebook pages. Oh, no, you're not. I didn't put it online. Ha! Ha! Forget that. You're on your own. I'm so sorry, and I apologize for that. I knew there was something I forgot today. So for those watching at home, just do the best you can to stay here and keep from going to that vacation land in Tahiti. I understand. I've been there too. I've heard pastors preach, and let me tell you, it can, you can certainly snooze off. And I understand I'm no better. I've heard me preach, and sometimes it's not fun. So I'll try to keep your attention at least a little bit and try to bring you back to the important parts. But Jesus is truly a threat to the Pharisees. Not a big surprise. They would have been glad to be rid of him right then and there. But this lesson gives us an insight that you don't see in any other gospel except for the Gospel of Luke. And that is, believe it or not, as much as we slam all the scribes and Pharisees as though they're all one big great unit that was all conspiring against Jesus, did you notice in our lesson for today that some of the scribes and the Pharisees were supportive of Jesus? They wanted him to live. And they warned him to get out of town, man. How's that for my Pittsburgh? I'm working on my Pittsburgh accent. It's bad. I can't, even do, I can't even do Pittsburgh right. It's terrible. Okay. But you just and I am a Pittsburgher. Am I? All right. Anyway, so going on. Get out of town. Is that better? Get down get, get down. get down. Get down town. All right. Get out of town, Jesus. And so Jesus, though, is defiant. Look at number two. He reluctantly is willing to get out of town. In his timing, by the way. But on the way out of town, he insults Herod by calling him, and I'm sorry for this, Carissa, he calls him a fox. What's so offensive about calling somebody a fox? My daughter would love to be called a fox. They're sneaky. She's a foxy lady. They're okay, cunning. that's bad. She's cunning. She's what now? Terry's hiding his head because he just said, my daughter's a foxy lady. Okay, sorry. <laughs> my daughter's looking at me like I'm crazy, too. It just came out. I'm sorry. Go with it. As for the rest of us. Running, as is everybody else is embarrassed and ashamed. I'm sorry for that, Carissa. What? A fox certainly is cunning, but also very destructive. And you, they lived in an agricultural age and, and place in society where the foxes did nothing but rip up their crops and kill their animals, and they thought a fox was the most worthless animal in existence. And for that reason, to refer to somebody as a fox is to label them as worthless. Worthless. And so on the way out, he not only insults Herod Antipas, but then he talks about his unrequited love for his people. Nothing hurts more if you've ever been rejected in love than to be rejected when you love somebody and they just are not on the same wavelength as you. And they just don't return that. It's very painful. And so Jesus came to bring God's love. You'd think that would be well received, but it is not. 
And there's a reason for that. Because Jesus' way is not the way of religious leaders and scribes and Pharisees. I say that as one who is a religious leader. I'm going to give you something today that I want you to take home. And if you ever see a religious leader doing some of the things, including me, that these are, that I'm going to speak right now, you need to go find another church. And I'm serious, even if it's this one. Or put me in my place, one of the two. That's okay. I'd actually be happier if you put me in my place. But why is Jesus such a threat to religious leaders? And what is it that offends the, uh, the scribes so much? And so those, again, who have your hand out, you're going to be able to take a look down below. Believing in the humanity of the Creator is a threat to those who have religious power. Because, you see, this is what upset the Pharisees. Jesus was claiming that He was the Messiah and the one who was bringing God near. And there is nothing more of a threat to a religious leader than God being close to us. Why? Because when God is close to us, religious leaders can no longer manipulate you control you, or get money from you, because you don't have to go through a religious leader anymore. Am I right? This is what priests, pastors, religious leaders do. They want to keep God distant and far away so that we can control your access to God. And as long as we can control your access to God, we got power over you to tell you where to go, how high to jump, how much money to give, so that we maintain our control and our power. There's the dirty secret about churches, about synagogues, about places of religion, about pastors and priests, about scribes and Pharisees. Anyone who uses their relationship with God as a pastor or a priest or a rabbi to limit your access to God is not a man or woman of God. They are not. Because I believe that Jesus came to bring God close to you, and because Jesus came to bring God close to you, you don't have to go through me to get to God. Now, if you want to come for me, to me for advice, I'm fine with that. But you don't need me to get you close to God. Not as a pastor or priest. You need me as your brother and sister in Christ, but not because I'm a pastor or a priest. So let's go on with this. So again, when access to God is controlled by a religious leader, they gain both power and wealth. And so what we tend to do as religious leaders is manipulate the presentation of God to suit our own benefits and needs. I'm going to skip this next part. If you really are interested, you can later. I really don't think it contributes to the sermon. Go over to the next page. So the word of life, we've been talking about 1 John. And now I'm going to seem like I'm skipping to 1 John, and I've just been talking about Jesus and the rejection of the hands of the Pharisees. But the lesson that we've been looking about of us really needing each other and studying the book of 1 John really goes with this lesson for today. Because it says in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, that Jesus came to bring God near to us. And that, again, is how I'm tying it together with the lesson for today that's appointed for the Sunday in Lent, because this is what's offensive to the Pharisees. Does this make sense? Jesus brings God near, but the Pharisees are offended by that because that, they therefore lose their power and their control over people. He's and taking out the middleman. To get out the middleman, that's right. Getting rid of the middleman. So the word of life appeared, John says, and brings the very life of God crashing into our world because God doesn't love us from a distance, but right up close and personal. One of the things I tell folks when I'm doing baptismal counseling, or even when I'm doing wedding counseling, and we're talking about sin, and a lot of people, especially, we do baptize infants in our church. We baptize older people too. We teenagers, I've done teenagers, I've done 80-year-olds, I've done everything in between. But I remember when parents come and they bring their kids and you want to, they want to bring them to be baptized and they're young and baby and they're cute and they're cuddly and they're warm and this is wonderful and, and you start talking about sin and about baptism uh, again being the sign of God's love and forgiveness and they kind of look at me kind of strange because you know their babies don't commit sin, don't you know? They're born babies with are perfect. They're born with it. But I tell the parents very quickly, 
you're going to know something that your baby's got sin in their heart. Oh, really? How quickly does it happen, parents, when that day comes when your child, you know, cries because they're hungry and so they get fed. They cry because their diaper's dirty, so their diapers change. They cry because they have to go to bed, and so they go to bed. And then all of a sudden they get this idea. Every single time I cry, mom and dad come jumping. And so all of a sudden they cry. They don't need food. They don't need clothing. They don't need their diaper change. They just want your time and your attention right now. Okay? So all of a sudden you see where that changes very quickly from a cry of, I desperately need something, to mom and dad, you're going to give it to me now because I want it. That's where that switch happens, where all of a sudden you say, oh, this baby can be selfish. And our job as parents is to teach them to grow up with Christ in their life so that their lives are transformed, so that their relationships are restored and forgiven. I'm wondering how that feeling would actually be if you actually heard a baby cry and they don't really need anything. They just want your attention right now. Does, I don't know how yeah. it would feel if you actually had heard that every single day. That's exactly what happens. And sometimes they don't get crazy. parents are ready to pull their hair out to sometimes, Johnny. You're right on. So you got this. Right on. So we know what God does. And this is what my point was. And so is that God, God could have stood there, you know, and been up in heaven and looked down and said, Hey, all right, you people, I forgive you. But you know what? We wouldn't believe it because we have that saying, if I don't touch it, I don't feel it, I don't see it, I don't believe it. God knows it about us. We're like Missouri. The show, is it Missouri? The show me show state. state. Right? We've got to see it to believe it. And so God does something spectacular. God says, I forgive you. And Jesus is born. Jesus is God's word of life. God's word of forgiveness, God's word of restoration that we can touch and feel and see and hold on to. So this is who Jesus is. He brings God from a distance near to us because you see there's no gap between Jesus and God. There's no gap between me and Jesus. And so what Jesus does is he closes the gap and makes it possible for you the common, ordinary lay person that's been so despised and manipulated and controlled by religious leaders for millennia, Jesus takes out the middleman and says, Oh, you don't need that middleman anymore. You can come directly to me because of what Jesus has done. Wow, isn't that powerful? That's what John does. Now do you see how these two lessons tie together? Spectacular. Jesus closes the gap. And there's always, because of Jesus, life for this world, hope for this world, forgiveness for this world. And those who purvey are purveyors of religious fear and dogmatism who want to try to put you in your place and tell you where to go and how to get off, how high to jump and try to take money from you. No place for us anywhere in this new economy of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus transforms us through love and bypasses the controlling interests of the powerful. Isn't that awesome? So, you notice my box. For those at home, you can't see it. If you watch the sermon later, maybe it will be online, but it isn't right now if you're streaming live at this very moment. But if you're in a church that are, that are, that are purveyors of fear, that are trying to tell you where to go, if you're afraid of hell, if you're afraid of your pastor, if you're afraid of, uh, of rejection, if you're fear, uh, fearful of doing something wrong, if you're fear of choosing the wrong direction, otherwise people are going to get you, here's my advice for you. Find a new church. Because that's not God. And that's not the way of Jesus. Fear shackles us and shackles the working of the Holy Spirit and trades the potential we have in Jesus for a vision of some earthly religious leader who doesn't have the authority or the right to have control over your life. Because Jesus' message is what? One of love, forgiveness, and bringing God near to you. What does this mean for us? Oh, I love this. I hope you're all inspired right now. Because this is where the rubber hits the road. This is what it means for you and me. That we are, because God brings Jesus near to us, we are now the life-giving agents of God. If Jesus is the life of God, we now have been given the life of God to be the life-giving agents of God. 
to the world. How awesome is that? So what we need to do is we need to stop peddling all of our prophecies of doom and gloom and stop patronizing messengers of despair and fear. I told you a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to tell this story again because it just is mind-boggling to me. I went to the AT&T store a couple of weeks ago, or a month or so ago, and I told you this. And, and, and there, I was sitting there for two hours with one of the, 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 the people there, one of the agents there who was trying to help me with my new phone, and it was very helpful. But all of a sudden, he found out I was a pastor because our cell phone is registered to the church. And so he starts talking to me on all the prophecies of the Bible and how almost with relish and glee how God was going to get everybody in the earth except for the one or two faithful people like you and me, Pastor. Aren't we lucky because we're on the good side of things. And he was almost like relishing and the destruction that was going to be unleashed on this planet and how everybody was going to die because all the prophecies were coming true and look at all this that God is going to unleash on people. I'm like, how is this a message of God? This is not God's message and that's not the message that we should be gleeful about. We should be gleeful about the fact that we're bringing God near. We need to stop being purveyors of doom and gloom. And we need to start bringing God near as God brought, was brought near by Jesus to us. So number two, look, we are the fruit of Jesus' life and Jesus' gift of life. And our purpose as being the fruit of Jesus' life is that we might have fellowship with one another. And that life needs to be shared. For it is in fellowship with one another that the life of God is made known to this world. Not by some pastor, not by some priest, not through fear, not through intimidation, but by our fellowship with one another. What's as spectacular about the church is this. There is not a one of you, not a one of you, not even my wife, would I know today were not for Jesus. I wouldn't have gone to Houghton College if I didn't have Jesus. She wouldn't have gone to Houghton College if there weren't Jesus involved there. I wouldn't, I'd pass all of you in the, in the mall or in the store somewhere, and uh, I wouldn't even wave at you because we shared nothing in common. Would you even live in Pittsburgh? I would, may not, probably wouldn't even live in Pittsburgh. I don't know what I'd be doing. I can tell you, I don't know. I certainly wouldn't be in East Pittsburgh. I would have never in God's green earth moved to East Pittsburgh. <coughs> it is not the type of town I would have chosen to live in. Okay? Oh, we like and so, too. Yeah, you like me too, oh, don't you? Yeah. You know, and here's the thing. Here, quite frankly, she likes Penn State. She's on the wrong side of history. I, I love Pitt. You know, we share nothing in common. You know, some people are on this side of things. Some people are on There's very little, honestly, that we share in common except for one thing. There's only one thing that brings us together today. And what is that again? Jesus. 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 That is it. That's why we sang that song at the beginning that I keep oppressing you with about, uh, uh, about we want to worship you and how it talks about you drive me crazy, but I'm stuck here with you. You know, there are a lot of people that we just don't always like in the church. They drive us crazy. But the witness of God is made known when people who drive each other crazy say, hey, I'm sticking with you and I am on your side. That's how we witness to Jesus because then people know that something's happened in that person's life, but they, they, they hang with people that drive them crazy. So we may not share anything else in common, but we're family. Because we have a blood tie together. We share the family name. We are called what? Children of God. Look at, look at Reuben Welsh's quote at the bottom of your page. But you see, the church is not a society of the congenial. It is a fellowship based on a common life in Jesus Christ. It is the will of God that Christian life be lived in the context of fellowship of a shared life. Wow. I cannot tell you, just to kind of end up with a personal testimony, I guess. I've been here for a few years at this church for 25. I've known him all his life. And, uh, yep, Johnny. Johnny, all his life. I've known a bunch of you folks. Well, those two all their life, three people all their lives. How amazing is that that are sitting here today? Um, what's amazing about being here this long, if you've been a pastor or have been a church or a community for that long, I can tell you there are people that will absolutely drive you crazy. I can tell you you will absolutely drive a lot of other people crazy when you're in a community because they feel the same way about you. 
There are so many times that I literally, I went from this church, slammed the door, and uh, went to my house, slammed the door again, and said, I am never going back. I'm quitting. I'm done. Okay? <laughs> Except for one, and, I, and you're laughing at that, but it is true. Ask my wife, it is so true. I've been done so many times at this church where I've just said, I'm fed up with these people. I'm tired of this. I'm, I was like Moses. I can't tell you how many times I like Moses. You remember what Moses did with the rabble of Jews? He had to leave, leave in the wilderness. He said, God, if you really love me, kill me now. Okay? Seriously, it's in the Bible. I've read it. It was my verse that got me through some times where I just was praying to God. Okay, if Moses prayed like that, God just kill me now. I'm done with these people. But you know what? I have a policy that I think is a good policy. When people drive you absolutely crazy, when you're just about ready to be done with them, you do everything possible to work through your conflict with them. And if you're going to leave, you've got to leave at least in peace. And so I would put some effort and I'd go to the person and try to work through stuff. And I said, you drive me crazy. I'm really mad at you, but we got to work through this. And um, one of two things would happen. Sometimes they'd leave. Nothing I could do about that. But those who would stay and work through with me, by the time we got worked through all of our stuff, I no, no longer felt like I needed to leave. Isn't that amazing? Because that's what I think we're supposed to do as the Church of Christ. <clears throat> I'm asking you to make a commitment to your brothers and sisters. They may drive you crazy, but just remember, it is when you two, the people that drive you the craziest, you can be one, is when the life of God is made known. That's something no scribe, no Pharisee, no priest, no religious leader, no pastor is going to tell you. It's all about bringing God near to you, and you bring God near to each other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful for this lesson. It is a challenging but awesome lesson to hear the good news that God has brought Jesus, has been brought near to us in Jesus Christ. It's challenging for those of us who are religious leaders who honestly would just like to tell people where to go and how high to jump and, and how much to give and on and on and on. But there is no place for that in the economy of the new kingdom of heaven. Because in the kingdom of heaven, guess what? You come to all of us directly through Jesus Christ. And in just a moment, we're going to partake of this holy meal. I'm going to have the privilege of offering that to people. And you again are going to come near to each one of them through the presence of Jesus Christ. They don't need me, at least not as a pastor or a priest. But they do need me as a brother in Christ, because we do truly need each other. And so help us to stay together, hang together, hold together through good times and bad that we might be a witness to Jesus Christ. For it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.